The ACCA Advanced Financial Management syllabus is huge. And in this section onwards, I'll be taking you through to revise the syllabus in very simple words. Now, firstly, there are four key areas that you must know so you can pass the AFM syllabus very easily. Firstly, you need to know there will be three decisions that we need to make in financial management including the investment decision, which means spend the money out in buying the asset, the financing decision, which means where does the money come from and the cost of finance, and also how we're going to be distributing the profit back to our investors, which means the dividend policy decisions. And of course, you may be aware that an increase in investment decision will certainly require more finance available to the business and of course, if we get more finance, alternatively, we will increase the dividend paid to our investors. It's very, also very important that you understand that three decisions are interlinked with each other. And if a business does a good job, of course, in terms of a business valuation's point of view, that the business value will be a lot higher. And of course, in the AFM syllabus, when we talked about the business valuation in particular, we are talking about the value of equity, how we're going to be determining that value of equity using the free cash flows to equity methodology, the value of debt, so for example, the valuation of traded debt in particular, what if, if there are any changes in risks when we are valuing the business, so how we're going to deal with it, especially when the business enters into a new industry, and of course, we need to determine the payment form. And in the AFM syllabus, for example, the payment form can be in the form of cash, in the form of convertible bond, and in the form of share for share exchange. So, which means we are exchanging your shares with my shares and involving no cash being spent by the acquirer. And of course, we will need to calculate the percentage of gains or losses as a result from each of the payment method in the exam. Of course, if the business is not doing a good job, we'll need to think about finally the reconstruction and reorganization of the business. So the simple term, the reconstruction and reorganization, simply means that we're going to be saving the business which means reconstructing the business, so for example, using the debt for equity swap. Alternatively, to reorganize the business to improve it further, so for example, by following the corporate governance, laws and regulations, that kind of stuff. And once we've covered the first part of the syllabus area, the majority part of the syllabus will be to focus on the basis of the investment decision. So here, we are particularly talking about the net present value analysis or the NPV analysis based on the future cash. Of course, in order to perform the NPV analysis, we need three factors. For example, the number of years into the future and the relevant cash flows. And here, I will interpret this as the free cash flows to firm or the free cash flow methodology and we'll talk about that later on. And finally, we need the appropriate discount factor, or we need a rate, so we can calculate that appropriate discount factor later on. So we talk about the investment decisions we are predicting what will be going on at some point in the future, and this is why when talking about the number of years, so as time goes by in the future, there might be a change in the foreign exchange rate risk. There might be a change in the interest rate. So this means that there might be a risk about the forex changes. There might be a risk or chance that the interest rate will change. So if I were to receive or pay money in foreign currency, I would suffer from the forex risk. If I were to borrow or to deposit money at some point in the future, we will be suffering from the interest rate risk. 
and how we're going to be managing the forex as well as the interest rate risk we will be using for example the internal method for example for the forex we will receive the foreign currency say no we'll only settle that in home currency for the interest rate on the other hand using the internal method for example we, we will be keeping a balance between the floating rate debt and the fixed rate debt altogether alternatively from the exams point of view we will be heavily examining the external technique so for example entering into the financial instrument contract so for example for the forex we may be entering into the money market hedge or the currency futures or swaps alternatively for the interest rate risk we will be entering into the forward rate agreement and something like that and in particular we are talking about the free cash flow methodology and from the exams point of view from my perspective I would like to personally divide this into three particular areas firstly I would say this will be a mix area of the cash flow methodology to be applied in this paper so for example we'll be looking at things like the payback period so for example uh, how many years that we can recover our initial investment alternatively we will be considering the time value of money effect which means the discounted payback period and of course we may be considering the risks involved as well and this is why we need to calculate something called duration because one of the disadvantages of using payback or discounted payback alone is that the payback or discounted payback only tells you when your initial investment actually pays back at some point in the future it does not really consider the cash flows beyond the payback point and this is why we need to look at the project's cash flows in total by considering how soon that we can get the 50% of the total present value uh, of the from the project and this is why we need to look at the duration later on and after that we will need to look at something called the internal rate of return as well as the modified internal rate of return as the relative measure will be relatively simple for non-financial managers to understand and also we also need to look at something called the value at risk or we can call it as the VAR so this means that given the level of confidence level how much value that we may lose over this period and this is what I mean by the value at risk and of course finally we'll be looking at using the black source option pricing model to calculate the real option value to this particular project so not only we look at the MPV of this project but also we need to consider the subsequent opportunity so we can expand the project or we can get rid of a project at some point in the future and that, that brings us further as well so how are we going to be calculating this of course we will be using the BSOP model and of course from the exams point of view nowadays that the examiner has simplified the BSOP model you don't really have to remember that formula you don't really have to check the formula because you can insert the variable in the spreadsheet function I will tell you I'll show you how in a second the second category of the free cash flow methodology will be combining this with the adjusted present value or the APV analysis because one of the disadvantages of using the traditional MPV is that we simply mix all those operating and financing cash flows all together and then to discount all of them using the weighted average cost of capital and to me yes it's okay but it's not so accurate and this is why we we'll like to separate these two cash flows out and for the cash flows related to operation we only discount it using the cost of equity without considering debt which means the cost of equity ungeared alternatively if cash flows related to the financing part we will be discounting them at the risk free rate in most circumstances the third category is what I mean by the international investment appraisal now what do I mean by international investment appraisal 
is where we will be investing our money overseas and to receive money in the foreign currency. And of course, we need to do the MPV calculation related to that. I will show you how in a second. Of course, all of these things we will need to consider, for example, the number of years, relevant cash flows, and the discount factor. We will need to consider the risks and uncertainty inside. Now, of course, the examiner will be very keen to ask you about to comment on additional matters to be considered. When you are performing the MPV, you always need to tell the examiner that number of years may not be okay, may not be correct, because the project may not be lasting for four years uh, as what we estimated before. Relevant cash flows estimates are not correct because there will be risks and uncertainties built in. For example, we need to look at the sensitivity analysis so this means that uh, how much does the key variable to change so that the project MPV will become zero. Alternatively, we can also consider the probability analysis. Because instead of giving me the absolute figure or the single figure for the estimated sales revenue, why not to have different many outcomes and we consider the probabilities inside. Alternatively, yes, nowadays we use simulation done by the computer, of course that will involve lots of management time uh, and may result in potential errors. However, it will give us more confidence that given the percentage of confidence level that how much MPV from this project that we can earn using a simulation analysis. Of course, finally, we can also talk about the risk adjusted discount rate. So in other words, if we find out that the project is quite risky, why not to increase the discount rate to incorporate additional risk so to make the overall project MPV to become lower? So that's very important though. And of course, I've mentioned about the discount factor or the discount rate will be a single rate. The discount factor will be one divided into one plus the discount rate for the power of n. So let's detail that in the third part of the syllabus from my perspective though. The third part of the syllabus, I would say that I would like to talk about the discount rate. So you can refer to this as the, for example, the weighted average cost of capital or the WAC for short. And of course, when we talk about the weighted average cost of capital or the discount rate there, I would like to focus on this. Firstly, where does your money come from? So which means that we need to look at the business finance. So for example, we can borrow some money from the bank or from others. Alternatively, we can list our company onto the stock exchange. Alternatively, we don't really have to buy the asset. We can lease the asset. We can also have the Islamic finance option as well. And after that, we will need to look at the cost of capital calculation, in particular to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So for example, we need to calculate the cost of equity using the dividend valuation model, using the capital asset pricing model or the CAPM formula. Alternatively, we'll be using the M&M per position number two. Of course, these formulae will be given by the examiner. At the same time, we'll also need to calculate the cost of debt, which means because for having interest expense, we can save tax. And this is why we need to times by one minus tax rate related to the cost of debt there. And after that, we'll need to calculate the cost of preference shares. We'll simply using the dividend from the preference share as the numerator and divide this into the preference share price. And this will arrive at the cost of preference share there. We mix them all together, and of course this will give me the weighted average cost of capital in the end. Of course, very importantly, we may need to consider the capital structure. Of course, from my perspective, from the AFM exam's point of view, we always focus on the M&M per position 2 application, unlike in the previous 
examiner style in many, many years ago that the m and proposition number three may also be tested. But here, we'll only be focusing on the m and proposition two application now. And of course, after that, the final bit in the AFM syllabus from my perspective, which is very important, is that we are talking about the organisational performance. Yes, we need to interpret some numbers by calculating some ratios or perhaps to predict what may be going on. So, for example, given the proposal goes ahead at some point in the future, what might be the P ratio look like or the potential earnings per share, you will need to tell the examiner about that. Alternatively, you may be given a lot of um, written requirements, most likely six marks related to corporate governance stuff, but don't get me wrong, the corporate governance topic tested in the AFM exam will be very, very practical. You need to tailor your answer specifically to the case. And of course, the key idea behind the corporate governance is all about the agency theory. I need to tell the examiner what might be the agency cost, for example, the payment that we need to make to the executive directors to make sure that they make decisions in the best interest of a company and something like that. And finally, very importantly, would be the economic environments that we are operating in. So, for example, we may be asked about the roles of World Bank or the IMF and this kind of stuff. So make sure that you are always ready for that. Of course, if you know about, from my perspective, these four key areas, three decisions, you know they'll be link interlinked with each other and affects the business value. You know that the investment decision based on most likely the free cash flows. And of course, you know about the discount rate stuff and also all sorts of other written part. Of course, you will score very high in the AFM mix up. Now, let's move on. From this section onwards, I'll be firstly taking you through to the free cash flow methodology, starting with the free cash flow and then revising the mixture of areas, APV analysis and international investment appraisal. So let's get started then in very, very simple words before you apply this knowledge to the actual exam. So firstly, let's consider the free cash flow methodology. What do I mean by free cash flows? are to be the cash flows available to whom? Of course, I would say that free cash flows can be the cash flows left to the entire business, but in test book, we call this as firm, or we can call it as the free cash flow to firm, for example. Alternatively, to only shareholders. So in other words, the free cash flow to equity. In order to calculate the free cash flow, my approach will be relatively straightforward indeed. Always, I will start off with the profit before interest and tax, and times by one minus tax rate. In order to arrive at the profit before interest and tax, we need sales revenue and all other costs to be deducted from the sales revenue. So let's make up a figure, let's say $100 for the PBIT, the tax rate being 20% there. So for example, to start off, it gives us $80 there. And of course, we'll need to plus the depreciation on the property plant equipment or the non-current asset back because these are non-cash, let's say $10. Alternatively, we will need to adjust for the working capital. So for example, an increase in inventory, for example, because we need to spend money out in buying inventory let's say $10, which is minus $10 from there. So after that, we'll also need to minus the pp and &E, property plant equipment, because for example, uh, that we invest our additional money in buying the pp and &E, so let's say that we invest $10 out. So if that's the case there, I would say that free cash flow to firm, or TF, becomes let's say 80 plus 10, 90, minus 10, minus 10, $70. So after that, 
In order to calculate the free cash flows to equity, we will use the free cash flows to firm and to minus because starting from a PBIT before deducting interest. And now I will need to deduct interest. At the same time, I would like to times by one minus tax rate on that to avoid double counting. Let's say that the interest expense will be $5 there. And we are told the tax rate, let's say 20% and times by one minus 20%. And that being the case, we minus $4 there. At the same time, finally, we may need to consider that the business may be issuing additional debt and gets money in into the business. Let's say $10. And after that, we can calculate the free cash flow to equity using 70 minus 4, that would be 66, plus 10, and that would be 76 there. So which means that the cash flows available only to equity holders will be 76. And in our exam, the free cash flows to equity sometimes is known as dividend capacity, which means the ability is that you can pay your dividend to shareholders. So if that's the case then, what we need to do finally, we may be asked to calculate something called the dividend cover. Now, the, to calculate the dividend cover, cover what? Cover dividend, you will need to use the free cash flows to equity and to divide this into the dividend paid or dividend payment, for example. Now, dividing into the dividend payment, so let's say that the business this year has paid let's say 7.6, or you can yeah, use million or thousand, something like that, of dividend to all shareholders. Now, if that's the case, then we will have 76 divided into 7.6, and that will be 10 times the ability, so we can utilize our cash flows to pay off to our shareholders in the end. Of course, in the exam, if you're also required to calculate, let's say in the part B, to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, you will need to determine the value of equity. I would say that the free cash flow to equity, sometimes is also known as VE. VE stands for the value of equity. So make sure that you're aware that the free cash flows to equity of $76 can also be the value of equity is one. Well. Now, after we've recapped or revised the free cash flow methodology, congratulations, yes, you can pass this paper very easily. So later on you can practice a few past exam questions and there'll be no problem for that whatsoever. Now, moving on then, I would say that based on the free cash flow methodology, we would like to revise the mixture of areas so firstly, let's look at the concept of payback period and also the dis discounted payback period. And finally, we'll also need to look at the duration concept. So make sure that we are ready for that. And of course, firstly, we'd like to look at the payback as well as the discounted payback period. And the way that I perform the calculation for the payback as well as the discounted payback is that I always lay out three columns, number of years of the project, and the cash flows, if we are talking about the payback, if we are calculating a discounted payback, of course, I will need to use present values. So if you are calculating the discounted payback. And the third column, I would like to summarize all the cumulative cash flows or present values, depending on whether or not you're using payback or discounted payback. So for example, at the very start, at the start of the year, or today, which means year zero, we would like to invest $100 out to set up a factory, to buy the equipment, whatever you like. At the end of the first year, you can claim $40 back. So if that's the case then, so far, that you haven't paid $60 back to your business. At the end of the second year, 
from the project's cash flows, for example, we pay back $70. So if that's the case, then we summarize 40 and 70, that would be 110. Greater than the original investments that you made, 100. You've already paid your initial investment back already. But by how much? I would say that, okay, somewhere between the year one and year two, that you paid your money back. Because at the end of the year one, you still have got $60 as a target, so you need to pay additional $6 back. But in, at the end of the second year, you pay $70 already. So what I would do is that I would take one year as a starting point, and plus the money that I haven't paid back of 60, divide this into the total money that will be coming into a business of 70 in total. So if that's the case then, I would calculate something like 1.86 years so I can pay my $100 back. Of course, the 140 and 70 there can either be, yes, the cash flows or present values. So depending on whether or not you're using payback or considering the time value of money effect, which means uh, the interest effect when you're calculating the dis discounted payback period. Of course, this would be absolutely different from the duration concept because when looking at the payback as well as the discounted payback, you only consider, okay, I've paid my money back already. So I don't really care how much money that we're coming into the business, let's say $1 or $100, I don't really care because using payback or discounted payback, I will need to determine when I pay my money back take 1.86 years to pay my money back, stop from there. So does not really consider cash flows beyond the payback point, and this is why we need to introduce something called the duration concept. Now, to calculate the duration concept, firstly, you will need to use the sum of the present values of each year times by the number of years, and divide this into the sum of the present values for each year. And of course, if I were you, I would like to make three narrative points on the exam script to score the full marks when we are using this methodology. Firstly, I would say that what this means is that this will stand for the number of years to recover 50% of the project present value. So making sure that you notice that if this is discounted or the cash flows discounted at the company's cost of capital. When you are calculating a present value. The second point I'd like to tell the examiner is that this means the number of years to recover 50% of our investment or initial investment, but making sure that you tell the examiner that only if the cash flows are discounted at the project's internal rate of return. Otherwise, you will get no marks on that. And the third point I'd like to tell the examiner is that the higher the duration, the riskier, or the higher the risks that the project will have you don't really have to say the opposite side, the lower the duration, the lower the risk that we have to, but only give one point, avoiding repetition will be very key to your exam. Now, let me show you how do we calculate duration in Excel. Now, I'd like to start to calculate the duration in the Excel function from the ACCO. I will firstly tell the examiner that what I'm calculating will be duration. Make sure that you tell the examiner about that. At the same time, okay, we have got a project, let's say the number of years. Let's say that year one and two, with the cash flows being $10 and $20. And let's say we discount it at 10% there. In the year one, we use 1 divided into 1 plus 10%, which means 
In year two, we use the previous figure divided into 1.1, and we calculate something called the present value. So we simply take equals to this times by the cash flows, and drag this here, underline this, that's all. To calculate the duration, I need to tell the examiner that present value times by the number of years. And then di divide this into the present value, sum of the present value altogether. Firstly, I would say that taking present value times by the number of years, draw this here. Of course, the sum, this plus that. Alternatively, you can use the Excel function, sum of these two, press enter, press the values that you've got that there, for example, equals to sum of the present values. So if that's the case then, the duration, I would say that equals to the present value, the sum of present values times by number of years, divide this into the sum of present values, and that becomes 1.64. I'll tell the examiner, okay, this is my final result, and um, please check that very carefully. So here, if 10% as the discount rate is referring to as the cost of capital, we are saying that the project would take approximately 1.64 years to recover 50% of the total present value. That's all. Make sure, yes, duration, you're ready for that. Now, let's continue with our story, which means number four. We calculate something called the internal rate of return and the modified internal rate of return, IRR and MIRR. Now, firstly, I would say that you don't really have to remember that formula nowadays or check the formula sheet for the MIRR calculation because you can use Excel directly and this will be relatively straightforward indeed. But from my perspective, for the narrative part, you will need to be required to tell the examiner, if I were you, firstly, I would like to tell the examiner that these would be relative figures. And this means that this would be simple to understand by non-financial managers. Secondly, the decision criteria is that whether or not the MIR or IRR will be greater than the company's cost of capital. And if the answer for that is yes, why not do the project? And thirdly, very importantly, or the reinvestment assumption, you can always tell the examiner about that. For example, the IRR will be reinvested using the IRR assumption. So this means that IRR effectively is the maximum cost of capital to the business. Alternatively, it's the real return per year to the business by considering its time value of money effect. Alternatively, the MIRR will be having the assumption that it will be, or cash flows will be reinvested in subsequent stages at the company's cost of capital. So make sure that you always tell the examiner about the reinvestment assumptions in these two calculations. Now, what I would do is that I would like to calculate the IRR as well as the MIRR. Very straightforward indeed. Let's look at another project here. For example, number of years from year zero now and year one and two. So let's say that the cash flows out, that I need to spend $100 out, and at the end of year one, I can get $20 back. At the end of year two, I can get $120. So if that's the case then, I'd like to calculate something called the IRR firstly. I would like to enter into equals to IRR formula, and open the bracket, and selecting all these cash flows, and press enter. So this means that the maximum cost to the business will be 20%. So this means that if the bank quotes me, yes, to do the project, 
you need to borrow at 23%? I would say no, because uh, this will not maximize the shareholders' wealth, because this will bring negative MPV to the company from the project. Alternatively, calculating MIRR will be relatively straightforward indeed. So equals to MIRR formally, open the brackets, and then selecting all these cash flows, but make sure that you tell the examiner that we are using the cost of capital. Don't use the IRR as the reinvestment assumption. For example, in our previous case, we can see that the cost of capital will be 10% there, so we can simply enter into 10%, comma, 10%. Make sure you enter to 10% in the Excel function. Make sure they are ready for that. And press enter, and that would be 19.16%. So this means that the maximum cost of capital, this means that by modifying the reinvestment assumption, the maximum cost to the business will be 0.19 or 19.16%. Make sure that you are ready for that. Now, let's continue our story. Number five, we need to look at something called value at risk, or we can call it as the VAR. And the calculation will be relatively straightforward indeed. The value at risk simply equals to the standard deviation, which means that uh, there might be a possibility that our average cash flow will be $10 and the actual cash flow will be $9 or something like that. So deviating from the mean or deviating or different from the average, and we times by something called Z. So luckily, nowadays, that the examiner will give you Z directly. It can either be 99% confidence level or 95% confidence level. And you can check the Z value from the standard normal distribution table directly. So for example, 99% that the examiner will directly give you 2.33, whereby 1.65 for 95% level. And then you will need to times by the T and we put a square root on top of that and of course you can say that and this would be T for the power 1 over 2 if I were you is that I would say that this would be 0 0.5 put a bracket next to that right so let's assume some figures in let's say the standard deviation of the project cash flow will be $30 there and we times by the set value of 2.33 if we are at 99% confidence level. Of course, using the standard deviation times by Z, and that would be the total amount deviating from the average. And we times by, let's say, if it is one year, and that becomes one. Alternatively, if it is four years, and that becomes, for example, two. And we use 30 times times by 2.33 and times by 2, and that becomes 139.8 dollars there. Now, we need to tell the examiner of what does that mean. So usually, uh, that calculation would stand for two marks, relatively straightforward. I would tell the examiner that this means that over four years, that we've got 99% chance that the project value will not fall by more than $139.8. This means that there might be a 1% chance that our project value will fall by more than 139.8, which means the value at risk. So make sure that you're ready for that. Okay, hope you're happy. Now, let's move on. Now let's look at something called the real options. Okay, uh, will be very, very important area from the exam's point of view. So nowadays, the, to calculate the real option value using a black source option pricing model, we simply insert the variables and job done. Now, what do I mean by that? 
let's say that the traditional MPV value of the project, let's say, will be $2.98 million negative. So this means that if you were to proceed with that project, you will end up with a loss-making position. And therefore, we will need to consider whether or not there will be additional options value in. Of course, we would say that the option value can either be the call option, which means the option to expand, which means carry on the project with additional investment in. Alternatively, the put option, which means the option to sell, which means we can abandon the project at some point in the future. To calculate the option value, we'll need to use the BSOP model, and we'll see that now. In order to do that, firstly, you will need to define certain variables. Firstly, you will need to tell the examiner what will be the present value of your project, and we can define this as the asset price or the PA. Let's say that the total present value, excluding any investment, will be $38.75 million. At the same time, we will need to define the cost that we need to spend in order to exercise the project or to proceed with the project, which means the cost element. Let's say $35 million that it is spent some money out in order to proceed with the project. We should tell the examiner about T, T, which means that the time before incurring costs. Now, time before that we can proceed with the $35 million to be invested will be two years. And we need to define the risk-free rate given in the question, let's say 3.5% there. And finally, the standard deviation, which means the volatility of cash flows, let's say 30% there. So what we need to do, the next step will be to insert all these variables into the Excel spreadsheet function given by the examiner. Now, if you're required to calculate the BSOP value, you can see the BSOP calculator in the bottom. And then, you simply insert the variables. So for example, the PA, yeah, 38.75, PE, yes, 35. R, which means uh, the risk free rate, 3.5%. T, yes, two years. The standard deviation of S, which means the volatility of cash flows, 30% there. You press enter, you will see the call option value, or C, standing for 9.53 there. So you simply copy that 9.53 in, so this means that to do this project, the total values that we can get will be $6.55 million in total. Just tell the examiner about this, and of course everything will be fine there. Now, let's revise the second category from the investment decision here, so let's see the APV analysis, or the adjusted present value. Relatively straightforward indeed, from my perspective. We can call it as the APV, or adjusted present value analysis. So, in the past, when we are using the MPV analysis, we're mixing all these cash flows all together, including the operating as well as the financing cash flows. However, to perform the APV calculation, we are having a clever idea on this. We are splitting cash flows into the base case MPV, and then plus or minus the present value of a financing effect. We are saying that if 
these are the cash flows related to the operating cash flows will be discounted using the cost of equity and geared, which means without considering a lot of uh, the, the debt element inside. Of course, for the present value of the financing effects, we are saying that these will be related to the uh, financing cash flows. And more specifically, from the exam's point of view, we are talking about three types of financing cash flows, and this will be discounted at the risk-free rates or the yield by the business related to its debt. Three types of financing cash flows will be the issue costs, okay, so if you're issuing debt, there might be issue costs in there, and related to interests, yeah, you need to consider the tax saving on that, and also the subsidy, especially if you're investing in overseas countries, that the government might give you the lower cost debt so you can enjoy the benefit from it. Now, firstly, in order to calculate that cost of equity, which is ungeared, what I would do usually would be to use these two ways from the current exam's point of view. Firstly, referring to the m and m per position number two, formerly cost of equity geared equals to the cost of equity ungeared plus cost of equity ungeared minus yield and times by the debt value times by one minus tax rate divide this into equity. Of course, this formula has been given by the examiner, so all you need to do is that the examiner may be giving you the target companies or the new industries, uh, I don't know, it's the cost of equity, including debt would be cost of equity geared, is given, and you are required to calculate the cost of equity which is ungeared by giving you all sorts of other variables as well. The second way so you can calculate the cost of equity which is ungeared would be to use the capital asset pricing model, simply be the cost of equity ungeared equals to the risk-free rate, for example, uh, the uh, yield from the government security, that kind of stuff, and plus the asset beta factor times by the yield from the market minus the risk-free rate there. Of course, to calculate the asset beta, I would say that I would like to use the de-gear exercise, the asset beta equals to the equity beta times by the equity value, divide this into equity value plus debt value times by one minus tax rate on that. So make sure they are ready for that. To calculate the um, financing effect cash flows, for example, for the issue costs, we'll simply use the issue cost percentage, for example, in order to raise $100 or times by the amount, you will need to incur 1% on that. So 1% times by $100, and then we need to times by 1 minus tax rates because costs will save us taxes, and this, why this will be a net cost to the business. For the interest element, on the other hand, we are simply saying that what will be the interest expense and times by the tax rate directly. And finally, for the subsidy, we need two steps in there. The step number one is that, yes, we'll need to pay interest on the monies that we borrow. And this means that I would like to take the interest times by the tax rate, same as what we've seen before. As the step number two there, because traditionally, we may need to borrow a 5% from the commercial bank, but from the government, we can only borrow at 3%. I will enjoy 2% of the cost savings if I were to borrow some money from the government, for example. I would like to take that difference, which means 2% on there, and times by the money that I borrow, let's say $100, and then for that benefit, I will need to pay tax on that, and what would be a net benefit after considering taxes, which means times by 1 minus the tax rate, and this will be the financing cash flows. Using these financing cash flows for each and every year and inputting the discount rate okay, at the risk-free rate and to discount them separately. So plus or minus all together and this will gives us the APV. If the APV is positive, yes, proceeds with the project and will bring the positive value 
to the business or to maximize shareholders' wealth. Now, the final area in the investment appraisal I would like to recap with you for the number three is the international one, which means we are investing our money overseas. Now, let's look at the international investment appraisal. Again, or basing on the concept of free cash flows there, so from my perspective, there are two things that you need to know from the international investment appraisal's point of view. Firstly, always that you need to predict the future forex rate or the foreign exchange rate using purchasing power parity theory. That's the starting point. Secondly, you need to know there will be two part cash flows. On top of that would be the cash flows from overseas country or subsidiary and the bottom part and that will be denominated in our own currency. Now firstly, using a purchasing power parity theory, you will need to understand the spot rate of your current exchange rate. So for example, for each UK pound that can be exchanged into $2, or we can call it as $2 stroke UK pound. And then, based on the estimated inflation in both of these countries, for example, in the UK and in the US, in the year number one, let's say, there will be estimates there will be 10% increase in prices, for example, inflation in the UK, or 15% happening in the US, in the year two, later on, 8% and 10% of the inflation in the UK and US, respectively. Now, the final step that we need to do is that, firstly, you will need to put the spot rating, let's say, to predict the future exchange rate in the year one. Firstly, you will need to take that spot rating, and then you will need to tell yourself that this will be your first currency, and this will be your second currency, which means the variable and base currency, but you don't really have to know that. First and second currency, so all you need to do is that one plus the inflation rate in the first currency, one plus the inflation rate in the second currency. Now, first currency denominated in the USD, so we take 15% there. Second currency, we are using UK pound, we are taking 10% from there. So 2 times by 1.15 uh, divide this into 1.1, and that becomes, for each UK pound, equals to 2.09 USD. So carry this forward in a year two, 2.09 USD is Joe UK pound, one plus in the first currency, AC US, which means 10% in the numerator, and in the denominator, 8% there. So that becomes the rate of 2.13 USD stroke UK pound. So this is how we predict the future exchange rate. Now, the second element is that we've got two parts cash flows there. You need to tell yourself that the first part of the cash flows, you need to tell yourself that these would be denominated in the foreign currency. So what do I mean by this is that you will see the layout of your international investment appraisal uh, MPV calculation for the future number of years. For example, in the year one and year two, we've got the sales revenue expect respectively. We've got different expenses, possibly with the royalty payments back to our parents' company. It is subtract that in the foreign currency. But very importantly is that when you calculate the tax paid, the shortcut approach would be firstly to deduct all the tax depreciation after the expenses. That's very important as a starting point there. Let's assume some figures. Assuming that we've got 100 of the sales revenue 
30 of the expenses and 20 of the tax depreciation and then we arrive at $50 and we need to pay tax on that. So for example, we calculate the tax paid, let's say 10% of taxes payable in the current year. We simply take that 10% and times by the taxable profit worth of 50, so that becomes $5 of the tax paid. And after that, we would say the tax depreciation is non-cash element. So this is why we cannot subtract it in the MPV calculation. So all we can do is to plot this back. Plot the tax depreciation in, let's say, $20 in. And that's all we can do. So carry this on in the year two, you can see the same thing. So make sure that you're ready for that. Of course, the examiner sometimes may be interested in, okay, adding a bit of stuff in asking you, okay, what if we've got tax losses that we can carry this back and to uh, enjoy the tax benefit on that? Okay, so after the tax depreciation deducting $20, you will also need to consider the adjustment for tax losses on that. Okay, so make sure that you're ready. Of course, after we've considered the first part of the cash flows, the second part of the cash flows, you always need to tell yourself will be denominated in our own currency. So after you've calculated all these cash flows denominated in the foreign currencies, you will need to adjust for the um, predicted exchange rate into your own currency. So any sort of cash flows paid by the subsidiary company or branch overseas to the parent will need to bring this back okay, in the second part of our cash flows. Of course, paying the taxes, okay, so on top of that in our own country will be absolutely fine there. Nothing special, but to make sure that you input all these elements into the formula so that you can score very high marks in this topic. Now, congratulations from my perspective. So far, I've recapped on the first part regarding the free cash flow mixture APV international investment appraisal uh, topics in the AFM syllabus. Congratulations on that. So make sure, yes, AFM syllabus, huge syllabus and very difficult indeed. But of course, I can help you with that with my course on AFM. I've got experience in marking, I've got experience in teaching the AFM in very simple words and using my own technique and own summary. I'm sure that you will benefit from my approach to ace your AFM exam in the upcoming city. My name is Steve Chun, the fellow member of ACCA, the course director at Global APC. I look forward to seeing you in the next of our session. Bye for now then.